thanks for joining us for Timber and the Digital Environment. Uh, next up is Microsoft. Um, no, don't know if you've ever heard of the company Microsoft, but they're a technology provider. I believe they make uh, software and whatnot. Um, Sala uh, uh, Eckhart is going to join us. Uh, she is the Director of uh, Transformation Service at Microsoft. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Sala has uh, a lot of expertise. She focuses on digital transformation, innovation, uh, digital twins, and um, you know, I'm very curious to see what Microsoft is up to as it relates to the construction industry and uh, looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Tom. And thank you, Ken, Ben, for inviting me to be a speaker at this event. I'm super excited to talk about digital building lifecycle in uh, digital fabrication and, and timber structures and how intelligent cloud and intelligent edge uh, play a big role in developing the future environments. Uh, this is very much in the R&D and innovation world, horizon two and three. So not necessarily things that are the everyday business as normal for the built environment industry, but this is for starting a, a conversation amongst all the different participants and stakeholders working for the better, more sustainable future. And let's switch to the next slide. So. When thinking about technology and thinking about how we develop the future build environments, it's very people centric. So it's not technology first, it's, it's actually people first and thinking about what type of processes and businesses people are managing and how the technology then as the third leg of the stool can help out. Um, here I have chosen an image about two people looking at the cityscape and planning what kind of city development they might be driving forward. It's very likely to be a smart city, smart environment project in the future where people are using wearable um, computers like the, the Microsoft HoloLens to uh, consume data in a structured format in, in a way that is visual data and it's easily comprehensible for everyone uh, depending on what, what lens they are bringing into the project. It might be an architect working with an owner, it might be a specialty engineer working with the design team. Um, we'll, we'll see in the future what type of personas we have collaborating together um, uh, and, and breaking down the traditional silos that might exist so with the people-centric approach, technology is there to de democratize the available data and, and make it consumable as the latest and the greatest data. So when thinking about the timber um, industry and uh, tim timber fabrication, digital fabrication, uh, the earlier on we can start building things digitally and verify what is the final outcome going to be like? What is the technical performance of that outcome going to be like? What is the social performance of that outcome going to be like? And how does the, the digital environment then bridge those two together and create something that we haven't been capable of developing ever before? Uh, that's where uh, creating that democratized data and making it people-centric uh, start to showcase its power. Um, when think about that people-centric approach, uh, and why it's so important for any type of co construction project and, and delivering the future built environments, we need to be able to make our decisions based on evidence. So the evidence goes beyond just collecting the data, but evidence is more about how do we actually refine the data that we have into information and possibly combine the static data that we can create uh, using building information models or digital twins in the future, and, and then use the, this dynamic data that is ever changing in our natural environment or the physical environment, the built environment at the same time, and then combine those two in a way that we can then um, make decisions based on the, the data and the evidence and, and create the trajectories that what are the feasible outcomes from the decisions that we might be making and exposing those options to the larger team to have the conversation and not make decisions in a silo or based on uh, our historical um, experience from past projects, but really leaning into uh, 
the future outcomes and, and creating those trajectories that what might happen if we make a decision, creating that cause effect um, scenario based on the data that we already have and the evidence that we already have. And that way we can start avoiding making the mistakes from the past or replicating what didn't work in the past. And, and that way, when thinking about things from a real estate owner's perspective, we are avoiding unnecessary investments and avoiding uh, misuse of resources and creating digital waste or, or physical waste. When thinking more about the, the digital fabrication and, and timber uh, industry, uh, data in the future needs to be more transoperable. Uh, the traditional uh, keyword has been interoperable, so you can exchange data between different software and data flows pretty freely between those platforms. But I chose to put a keyword transoperable here because in the future, you need to be able to consume the data on multiple different platforms and with multiple different devices. Uh, the machinery needs to be able to consume the same data as people are consuming as decision makers. And the data needs to be something that you can create a business intelligent dashboards, or you can create uh, extended reality experiences depending on how people want to consume that information and then continue refining it into knowledge. Data also needs to be something that is reusable. So when thinking about the, the future projects and, and how the built environment is never static, we need to be able to use what, what data has already been created and, and link it into multiple different platforms. So if you are developing a, a big um, stadium project, for example, um, you, you might have your building information model available, but you might also need some other supportive information like the weather conditions. A and that might be related to the pre-construction and construction phase of the project. But when you're collecting all that data, it becomes historical evidence uh, so that in the future, if someone is doing facility management, owner operations, repairs, uh, retrofits, renovations, revamps of the same uh, structure or, or the project, they can use that uh, as evidence for determining what was the cause and effect of something aging differently or deteriorating differently, uh, what were the causes in the long run of the technical life cycle of that built environment that then we are dealing with. Uh, and when we know exactly who the project teams were, what their personas were, what information were they developing and delivering for the project team, what were they responsible and accountable for, it's easy to connect them back into the, the project later on and ask for their expertise and expose the data that or the information that has been accumulated over the digital building life cycle for their um, advice. A and that way expand the project team uh, with the, the current or the past project team with the current or the future project team. A and that way continue reusing the relevant data and the reliable digital proof. Data also needs to be refinable. So when thinking about the future of the built environment and how timber structures are very easy to change, um, it doesn't require a lot of different um, difficult tools to make a whole or add more uh, structure into existing timber structures. Um, data enables us to refine what already exists and how we can continue adding on more to it, how we can morph what already exists and, and that way meet more of the future requirements of the end users. The end users not necessarily only being the tenants, but also those people that are maintaining and repairing our, our buildings and continuing to optimize their technical performance. Um, here is a as example of something that is a castle-like structure and, and might not be something that we would develop in the future. But the idea is that the, the built environment needs to be morphing based on the people-centric needs. Uh, and that way, it's not always the need for demolishing something that already exists, but it's more about reusing, recycling, upcycling, uh, and continue to improve what we already have 
and that way again avoid the unnecessary investments or creating uh, additional waste. Here's a, a simplified image of the digital building life cycle that I created a couple of years ago. Uh, and this calls for the, the developers and the owners to start the digital building life cycle by defining that database investment decision process and defining what the digital building life cycle strategy is for them. Uh, it's not expected that all developers and real estate owners are always uh, developing a real estate or infrastructure to hold and own it for a very long time. It might be something that they they want to sell very early on. But then again, the decisions that they make very early on are going to be impacting the technical life cycle of that building or infrastructure. And that's why it's so important that the design strategy um, that the architects and engineers are then implementing are based on the long run, the, uh, the end in mind strategy and thinking about how do we actually collect the relevant data and, and create the digital thread all the way from the planning phase, all the way to the end of the building's technical life cycle and, and what might be usable uh, in, during those different uh, milestones when we need to uh, retrofit or renovate the building and, and change it according to the end user's needs. So when the design and engineering team then start off their BIM-centric design process, that's where the, the digital twin of the physical infrastructure starts to morph and starts to take its shape. And that's where we start to collect the, the structured data that is very relevant for the future needs of the multi-dimensional BIM. So when we uh, continue on with the BIM-centric uh, design, we are constantly, we should be constantly uh, analyzing the total cost of that environment and, and simulate the total performance of that environment. And when thinking about timber structures, there's a lot of uh, data, physical and chemical data available about those structures and those materials. And, and there is that cost analysis data available from the manufacturers and the fabricators that can be tied into the digital building life cycle for that evidence and database uh, decision making. And that way, when the, <clears throat> the design team is continuing on with their process, they can already start having the meaningful discussions with the developer that how do they actually plan to implement the project? That is it that they want the building or the infrastructure to, to be built on site? Or what are the opportunities of creating and prefabricating, pre-manufacturing, pre-assembling things off-site? And is it that they are looking at volumetric or modular construction? Or what, what kind of, what size components are they willing to uh, uh, assemble on site? And how do they actually want to implement it uh, with the support of the professionals from the industry? And that way, when we have accumulated the digital truth about the physical artifact and created the the digital twin of the physical artifact, we can continue using the multi-dimensional BIM for supporting the developer's decision-making with cost engineering, and then later on value engineering, different suppliers, uh, the project schedule, uh, analyzing accessibility, analyzing security, uh, analyzing the, the sustainability of that project in the long, long term, and then feeding all that information uh, into the digital supply chain management so that everyone is on board with the same outcome in mind and continuing to accumulate the digital truth that then becomes the, the foundational uh, element for digital twins. And this is where the digital twins, they have the BIM component very early on. Uh, and then it's easy to start adding the Internet of Actions data uh, and Internet of Things data uh, GIS data, reality capture data, all these different components that make up the digital twin for you uh, to be something that becomes a tool for managing the smart environments of the future. And then when you're measuring how your infrastructure or building is performing, uh, you're using digital twins for tracking that, creating those uh, tra trajectories for seeing when is the optimal time uh, to uh, plan for a tenant improvement or retrofit, renovation, or revamp, 
And that way, it's not a time-based decision necessarily. It's more about the condition-based decision-making. And that way, you're not improving something too early in its technical life cycle if there is evidence that the, the structure is healthy enough to continue, or you're not waiting until something is completely broken down and then impacting uh, other structures or, or systems surrounding it, making your retrofit or renovation revamp project uh, ever so more expensive. And then finally, when um, the building it has gone through multiple cycles of the digital building life cycle. So every time that you make a change into your physical environment, you uh, start accumulating a new stream of data and evidence. And, and ultimately, uh, the building might come to its uh, physical life cycle end uh, and it is demolished. But by then, you already know what materials you have in that building, what systems you have in the building, and then you can start to uh, kind of uh, plan how the building is actually demolished so that all those materials uh, and systems are then recycled for other projects or used as uh, materials for creating something completely new. So it's more about that zero waste approach uh, in dem demolishing and taking down existing infrastructure than creating more waste. But overall, what is more important is that the digital building life cycle continues on regardless of the physical infrastructure not existing anymore. And that way, when designing and, and planning for the future projects in a specific location, you already have a lot of evidence about how was the past infrastructure or the building performing in that specific location? Uh, what were the opportunities? What were the, the difficulties? What were the issues or the problems? Uh, and then sharing that knowledge with the future design and engineering team so they can continue doing better uh, the next round. I have uh, an example from uh, a Finnish architecture uh, group, uh, Keskisarja, Tynkkynen, Krolla, and De La Grange. And they created a dragon skin pavilion in Hong Kong about a decade ago. But I find it very interesting example of digital fabrication that I wanted to share with you today. Um, so when, when starting a, a project with mass timber or any, anything that is uh, digital fabrication at, with wooden materials, it's very important to have that clear vision of what do you want to achieve and how does that vision actually play into your sustainability goals and accessibility goals, uh, security and safety of people uh, and creating an environment that people actually want to come in. Define what is the reason that this structure exists uh, and what is attracting the end users to come into that place. But also making it very clear for the design team that this structure is not necessarily something that is a one-time structure, but it needs to be something that can continue uh, existing and morphing uh, for future use cases. It, it might be something that can be transported into a completely new environment uh, when it's no longer needed in its uh, original location. Uh, and that way, when starting to define the requirements with the project team and with the, the designers, engineers, the fabricators, uh, it's about programming the project before it goes into deeper design and into the fabrication into uh, creating it physically. Um, so I found it very interesting that this group of architects had created this very de well-defined process for um, defining early on what are the requirements of data and what are the requirements of information? What are the decision-making points in order to create the different components of this pavilion and, and then be able to uh, fabricate it in factory conditions, or in, in this case, prototyping laboratory um, conditions. And then once those requirements are well-defined and created in digital format, uh, it's very easy to start refining the data into uh, something that you can then analyze and simulate, create the different uh, options, um, test them out digitally, uh, show what the different options look like aesthetically for the, the developer 
and get their approval on things, share the, the outcome digitally for those that might be the end users of this physical infrastructure. And, and that way, make sure that you're not designing something that is going to be disabling the end user at some point in time, or that if there are special needs from anyone as an end user, that those requirements can be met. And overall, adopt to a universal design approach in creating the future infrastructure. And that's where timber structures are so uh, great that they can be shaped into a lot of different shapes. They can be combined as components to each other and made into something that is an assembly uh, of things. And, and that way, uh, you can actually start productizing a lot of these different assemblies into something that is a bigger entity. And then when thinking about managing and maintaining that structure, it is easier to maintain a much bigger entity than a single component. Then um, the, the next stage is refining that data into information. So here um, it, it's about creating information that is both machine readable, but also comprehensible for a human being. So this way, it's easier to start pre, uh, creating that readiness for the pre-fabrication, pre-manufacturing process, uh, plan out what kind of tools you need to be using, what kind of resources do you need to be using, how do you overall um, plan out that digital supply chain so that you have all your resources in the right location at the right time, and the quality of the product is meeting the original requirements but also that you can verify that how the manufacturing process is developing that long-term um, plan for creating sustainable environment and meeting those technical and, and social requirements that were originally defined in the, the early planning phase. And this way, again, uh, the information is made very transparent for both the owner developer, but also for the design team, but also for the manufacturing fabrication team. So everyone is collaborating around the same digital information and making decisions as a team. What is uh, very important about timber structures is that there's a lot of knowledge that is accumulated over time when uh, the digital data is refined into information, but then uh, applied into knowledge. So when you have the applicability and uh, the application known, then you can start building up the knowledge of how do you replicate? How do you continue creating the same component, but creating different shapes? Uh, and that way, when thinking about training people's digital skills, training their physical skills, uh, it's, it's all supported with these digital platforms because it's so easy to simulate and, and digitally fabricate things and test them out in extended reality uh, platforms, mixed reality platforms, and really start building up that muscle memory for, for the skilled workforce and the trades, how to assemble, how to uh, manufacture these components and how to deal with the material like what. And when we have that knowledge accumulated, over time it becomes that organizational wisdom that we are all curious about, that how do we continue replicating the best practices and continue feeding and fostering innovation so that the next generations of builders can learn from the past, learn from the, the uh, intelligence and the information that we've been able to accumulate and learn from the digital platforms, learn from, from the people that have been working in the industry for a very long time. And that way, uh, continue feeding that doing better uh, the next time around. Um, that, that is the key in uh, digital digital fabrication uh, in timber structures. So thank you everyone for listening today. It was a pleasure talking with you and I look forward to our Q&A. Well, really, uh, really interesting presentation, Zella. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Uh, we had a handful of questions here. If there's anyone that uh, has a question, please uh, type it in. I'll try to get to it. Um, just want to kind of start with a general question related to, to Microsoft. And, um, you know, I've noticed obviously Microsoft lately has been marketing more and more to the construction industry. Um, can you kind of touch on a little bit about, uh, you know, some of your products that, uh, that are kind of geared for the building industry, for architects, engineers, uh, contractors? I mean, 
Um, obviously, like Microsoft Dynamics comes to mind, like backend uh, management. Do, do you have any particular partnerships with uh, software companies that service this industry? Do you have uh, specific products that service the industry? Yeah, very good question. So we are a platform company and we are all about partnerships. So when thinking about how our technology is applicable for the built environment industry, it is the same technology that is developed for all the other industry verticals. Uh, but the application of these technologies really depend on how the, the uh, specialists and the experts in the built environment industry want to use these tools. So it all begins with the people managing the processes and then finding the right tools. But when thinking about our cloud, for example, uh, you can adopt to uh, our Azure cloud mm -hmm. uh, as an infrastructure and, and that way start breaking down the organizational silos of data gatekeepers, uh, which we have all experienced in the past that if someone was taking a vacation and they had data saved on their own personal hard drive, nobody else would be able to access it. And that would slow down the project team. But by adopting to a, a cloud as an infrastructure, you can start building up the, the organizational and digital core, start democratizing the data and making it accessible for everyone who needs to access it. Yep. But then at the same time, make sure that it is the highest data security in the world that you're providing for your team. And then uh, the second layer is that the cloud as, as a um, platform. So uh, that's where the integration of your partners come to play, that if you already have the cloud infrastructure as your backbone, then as your organization is digitally transforming, you can then integrate your vendors and your partners into the same platform uh, and then start creating the services that are usable for your own organization. But then ultimately, if once your organization is digitally transformed, uh, it becomes cloud as a service and you can start developing applications for your own customers mm -hmm. and start creating a business model around that. Um, so that's uh, the, the Azure cloud side of things. Uh, then there is the, the intelligent edge where um, the processing power comes into the devices that are installed into the physical environment and, and the data can be actually processed on premises very fast and then fed back into the system that needs to be consuming it. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned the Dynamics platform. That is a beautiful example. Uh, power platform, Power Apps is another one that you can really start refining the data into applicable knowledge and, and information. Then there is a, one of my favorite technologies, the HoloLens, uh, that is very applicable for the built environment that you put on a wearable computer and you can experience your project in a digital format in the physical environment before it's actually built. Uh, and that's where I see a lot of growth opportunity in the built environment that how do you actually create the test fits before you actually go out with your crew to uh, install something and how do you expose the project for the developer, the, the finance organization of the project. So they, they are confident in what they are spending their millions on and, mm -hmm. and kind of creating that collaborative environment across the, the project teams that everyone is accessing and experiencing the same data at the same time mm -hmm. and making decisions based on what they are experiencing and, and having the dialogue and the, the conversation that is this really what we are aiming to do? Here's my idea how I might implement it. And that way it continue improving the project quality. Yeah. So um, so obviously, I mean, there's a whole spectrum of products that Microsoft has and, and a lot of the products that we use obviously run on Microsoft uh, operating systems and, and uh, digital backbone. So it's sort of like uh, it's ever present uh, in our industry. Um, so, so curious, I mean, you, your presentation kind of touched on a lot of the workflows, uh, digital workflows around collaboration, bringing information together, um, you know, helping to productize and, uh, and optimize work and, uh, and thinking about, you know, taking that with that, uh, not just the end product, but the information that you're gathering there and, and utilizing that into the future. So uh, Microsoft obviously builds a lot. I mean, you have uh, many offices around the world. You've got likely data centers, maybe even you know, like manufacturing facilities. Uh, are you incorporating these concepts into your uh, your day-to-day -day work? I mean, maybe you don't have perspective on it, but 
Um, you know, we've I've, I've been involved personally with some data centers uh, with a company that rhymes with Noodle, and they are like heavy into using BIM and, and digital technologies. And um, you know, they get they get to the point where they uh, you know they control the intellectual property, they control the um, the you know the end the, the use of components, the layouts, and actually create like a very uh, very tight set of assembly drawings. They dictate their suppliers and they actually give you like a full set of plans that you can go out and actually build the, the data center with. Uh, so they're actually taking full advantage of these these types of systems you know, because they're in the business of producing data centers over and over and over again around the world. Is Microsoft implementing um, similar uh, uses within their own portfolio products and, and operations? A uh, very good question. So it, it really depends on uh, are you talking about the data center organization or the corporate real estate where I come from? Uh, that are you dealing with something that is mass producing the same um, building archetype over and over again and continuing to find how you can can um, be more efficient at, at doing so? Mm -hmm. uh, but from the corporate real estate uh, point of view, things are, are less cookie cutter. But there are the elements of replication that can be applied into uh, multitudes of different environments to create the end user experiences that are then made available for everyone who works on our campuses or visits our campuses. And, and that's where I'm really curious about the BIM technology and digital twin technology that, that if we can productize things for certain types of spaces, workspaces or visitor spaces, etc that we can continue developing the strategy, strategic work environments for people that, that have very agile uh, job descriptions and very agile teams. Um, and that way, when there is the level of expectation about end user experiences, but the level of expectation for the technical performance of the environment, uh, BIM solutions really support analyzing and simulating those things and, and finding where there is an opportunity for tweaking things and mm -hmm. really supporting automating uh, traditionally analog processes so that the, the technology is there to support people manage the processes but not but then leave more room for for discussion so that that way when looking to the long run long horizon uh, there should be less uh, requests for information because people already have that information made available and accessible in format of BIM or digital twins. A and that way, the discussions that people have is more about building the collaboration, exposing ideas, how to continue improving, how to continue improving the, the outcomes that we are trying to achieve, rather than asking uh, what, when, where, how much. Mm -hmm. So you're doing that continuity of uh, information across the project. Yeah. So I, I mean, a lot of these, a lot of these concepts, and sort of like the, let's call it um, knowledge work that's required to implement these types of strategies within businesses. I mean, it's very, uh, it can be complex and uh, and be a lot of heavy lifting in a big organization, and and often difficult and 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 uh, unobtainable for smaller organizations. So what's your advice for, you know, small to medium sized enterprises that don't have a digital strategy in place right now? Um, how do you start? Where do you find expertise? Should you rely on third parties uh, when you're selecting digital platforms to run your business on? Uh, what should you look for? Um, maybe kind of like build on, on that a little bit and, and explain how, how to roll out a digital strategy within a business. Yeah, uh, gladly. Um, it's, it all begins with the data security. That That is probably the, the number one um, advice for starting to build up the digital core that, that you need to be aware of who's actually hosting your data, who's accessing your data, where is the data stored. Um, and, and that way it's shaping the discussion much further out than just going out and, and buying a, off the shelf solution and a tool and then asking people to start using it. It, it more uh, needs to be shaped on the digital processes and looking into uh, what kind of processes currently exist, where there is um, opportunity for simplifying and automating things and really creating the digital thread. So you, you don't end up creating digital silos, but really creating something that is more people centric digital environment uh, and then seeking out 
the experts in the industry to help you uh, define that. Um, Microsoft helps customers all the time to, to really define their digital core and, and plug in the different components of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there are a lot of uh, specialty consultants out there that are um, as, as specialized in either the real estate owner's perspective in BIM or into the ar architectural aspect of BIM, engineering aspect, digital construction aspect. A lot of help is out there, but uh, it all kind of needs to be, be born from within that how do you mm -hmm. create a data secure uh, digital core for your organization that you don't end up creating issues or, or bigger problems down in the line. Yeah, right on. <laughs> so uh, people, uh, we just have, we got to wrap up right now, but uh, people want to learn more um, about what Microsoft is doing in the digital transformation space or or connect with you or someone at Microsoft uh, for help around uh, the whole digital transformation process. How, how would they do that? Uh, LinkedIn is an excellent platform. Uh, you can check out my article series about the digital building lifecycle on LinkedIn. And then we have our commercial real estate group, the CRE Microsoft, also on LinkedIn as its own uh, profile and they publish amazing stories from our regional projects. Cool. Okay. Well, great. Thank you so much for joining us today. Really enjoyed your presentation and uh, ho hopefully we'll talk soon. Thank you so much, Tom. Thanks.